Good afternoon and welcome to everyone and apologies for the technical difficulties. This is, this is sort of new technology to all of us. My name is Susan Lilas and I'm the Executive Vice President of the ICCF Group. We're a nonprofit organization which supports the leadership of the Bipartisan International Conservation Caucus and the United States Senate and House of Representatives. For more information about the ICCF Group, the International Conservation Caucus and the 18 Congressional and Parliamentary Conservation Caucuses we support around the world, please visit internationalconservation.org. We are honored today to support caucus leadership in hosting this virtual caucus briefing on wildlife trade, origins of COVID-19, and preventing future pandemics. Zoonotic diseases are not a new phenomenon as we will discuss more about today but rarely has one had the global impact that we're experiencing with COVID-19. There's no reason to think that an outbreak like this or even worse could not happen again. So we must come together now to find collaborative solutions. First, I would like to thank the International Conservation Caucus co-chairs participating in today's discussion. Senator Tom Udall from New Mexico, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island, Senator Rob Portman from Ohio, Congresswoman Betty McCollum from Minnesota, Congressman Jeff Fortenberry from Nebraska, Congressman Henry Cuellar from Texas, and Congressman David Joyce from Ohio. There's also, I'd like to thank the other members of the International Conservation Caucus um, who are calling in to participate in the discussion. Thank you all for your leadership. Um, I'd now like to recognize our expert panelists in the order which, in which they will present. Welcome John Scanlon, Special Envoy for African Parks and former Secretary General of CITES. Dr. Christian Walzer, Executive Director of Health at the Wildlife Conservation Society. Dr. Jamil Mandima, Deputy Vice President for Conservation at IFAW. And David Quammen, author of Spillover, animal infections, and the next human pandemic. Thank you also to everyone joining via live stream on YouTube. And again, thank you for your patience with that. And a special welcome to members of Parliamentary Conservation Caucuses joining us today from Africa, from Asia, the Caribbean, Latin America, and the UK. Thank you also to ICCF's many corporate and NGO partners. As discussed, this is a new format for many of us. So I'd like to give an overview of today's proceedings. ICCF will help moderate in a technical role, but this discussion will be driven by members of the caucus and by our expert panelists. Some members are joining by video and others by phone. In a moment, I'll turn over the first portion of the briefing to Chairman McCullum, who will give an opening statement before recognizing Senator Portman and Senator Udall for their opening statements. I will then invite each of the panelists to give a five minute presentation. We'll then moderate a question and answer period to give members of Congress the opportunity to question our expert panelists. Now members may come and go, but we'll try to recognize all of them for the benefit of our panelists and audience. To conclude the meeting, I will turn it over to ICCF's founder and chairman, David Barron, for brief closing statements. I would now like to invite Chairman Betty McCullum to take the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Susan, and thank you, David. Um, we, uh, we thank you for ICCF organizing this uh, discussion. And it's my pleasure to welcome the expert panelists with us today. We are so grateful that you are lending your time and your knowledge to this briefing. We are facing an unprecedented moment in our history, COVID-19, claiming thousands of lives, tens of thousands more are ill or will become ill, and millions are out of work. In Congress, our immediate focus is on providing relief to all Americans as we weather the storm together. However, even as we respond to the current crisis, we cannot neglect to address the root cause of this pandemic and seek out solutions to prevent the next one. Because if we don't address the root causes, the next pandemic could be right around the corner. I've read lots of books on pandemic prevention and response and preparation for today's briefing, but David Barron sharing spillover with me was absolutely a wonderful choice. 
uh, author David Quantum, you are gifted. You are gifted because you can take a complex issue based on science, break it down so that it is extremely accessible to the reader. And that is so important that readers like myself can actually find a book on pandemics, a page turner at times. Early on in your book, you outline three aspects of human wildlife interaction that make pandemics uh, and their threat of them more prevalent in our world. The first one is modern mankind is disrupting ecosystems at an alarming pace. Two, these ecosystems are millions of viruses which are unseen and mostly undiscovered because they replicate inside the living cells of the host organism. And three, human disruption of the ecosystem destroys and transports traditional hosts and viruses look for new hosts, including the human body. In that sense, these viruses can become like an invasive species, except they're colonizing in our bodies instead of bodies of water or a forest. We'll hear from our panelists today. COVID-19 is among a category of diseases known as zoonic, diseases transmittable from animals to humans. SARS, MERS, HIV AIDS, and Ebola are similar infections, zoonic diseases that first appeared in wildlife. But as the world's population grows and we encroach more and more on wild places, that will lead to increases in human wildlife interaction Hungry people look for protein in the meat of wild animals. The outbreak of COVID-19 facing us today was first identified in Huan, China, in Hebei province. Many, um, it, you know, when it becomes a first known case in an area or a city, we look to see what the cause might be. Well, in Hunan, the Hunan uh, seafood wholesale market, so-called wet market, well, they live and they slaughter wildlife and it's sold for human consumption. Humans are exposed to animal car carcasses, blood, feces within these markets, creating high-risk environments for the spillover of viruses from wildlife to humans. Those markets and commercial consumption of wildlife are not unique to China. They exist in some form or the other across Asia, Africa, and Latin America. My fellow International Caucus co-chairs in the House have written President Trump, urging them to lead an international effort to stop these types of dangerous wildlife tr uh, trade practices which endanger global public health. Our Senate colleagues have written the Secretary of State urging the same. So we're gonna hear from expert witnesses today, and I hope along with you to gain a better sense of wildlife tract practices that led to this pandemic and how the science of disease is spread, and to consider actions we can take as member of Congress working with our international colleagues to prevent the spread of future outbreaks. With that, I thank you again for putting this forum together I look forward to listening to it, and right now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague who's been leading on this in the Senate, Mr. Portman. Thank you to Chair McCollum, and thanks for those thoughtful comments. Um, I appreciate ICCF putting this together, and David and Susan for your willingness to moderate it, and the panelists, thank you for being here. We look forward to hearing from you. I will say I'm a little biased toward uh, David Quammen since he was born in my hometown of Cincinnati, Ohio, where I am right now. Um, David, it's a beautiful day here uh, in Cincinnati, and uh, uh, your book, Spillover, has been uh, very influential to me and to, and to so many people, so we're, we're proud of you here in Cincinnati. Um, uh, we're seeing the devastating results of COVID-19 right now. I mean, in the grim daily reports we just had in Ohio of the number of hospitalizations, the number of patients on ventilators, the number of fatalities. I think it's uh, safe to say that every one of us on this call are working. I know the members and the staff are from Congress uh, working very hard to try to combat this, uh, provide resources to our healthcare workers on the front lines, uh, relief to our families. We represent to the workers and the small businesses that are really suffering greatly from this. So it's been devastating. And uh, so we want to know what the source is. We want to uh, try to avoid it from happening again. Uh, I, I think some of the panelists today um, will talk about that, uh, as I understand it. And I, all I can say is we all have a very strong interest in preventing an outbreak, outbreak like this one from happening in the future. We don't know the exact origins of COVID-19. Uh, there are, are lots of different theories out there. I imagine we'll hear some of that today. What we do know is that it's a zoonotic disease. So it was transmitted from uh, animals to humans to humans. and um, I, I think it's uh, 
very uh, widely known now that uh, this is a big issue. Again, in spillover, it's talked about, and, and, you know, frankly, we haven't been as attentive to it as we should have been. But these zoonotic diseases are very prevalent. Uh, they've caused millions of deaths and significant economic damage uh, throughout the world. USAID now says that 70% of the new human infectious disease outbreaks originate from animals. 70%. Of course, this includes SARS, HIV, Ebola, malaria, yellow fever, and others. And as we'll hear today, this transmission of disease from animals to humans raises a lot of, of very tough questions about the relationship between uh, humans and the natural environment. We've talked a little about that already, about food safety and security, about uh, food security uh, in some of these developing countries, about the commercial trade in wildlife. The reports we have so far have indicated that COVID-19 may have originated from a wildlife market in Wuhan, China. Uh, we don't know that for sure, but that's what uh, some of the reports are indicating. It, it came from somewhere, and um, specifically, the coronavirus, we think, originated from a bat, uh, was transferred to a pangolin, and then transmitted to, to a human. As a lot of conservation groups have recently pointed out, by the way, the commercial trade in pangolins is very prevalent today, um, even though it's been listed on the highest level of protection under CITES since 2016. So I'm really pleased we have uh, former CITI Secretary General Scanlon with us today. I look forward to hearing from you, sir, and hopefully you'll talk a little about how we can do a better job enforcing the uh, CITES uh, protections on, on, on wildlife, including pangolins. I know uh, he will address this further, but obviously one way to reduce human contact with animals is to combat this illegal wildlife trade more broadly. Senator Coons and Senator Flake, uh, I joined them in co-sponsoring what's called the End Wildlife Trafficking Act. It was signed into law back in 2016, and this is the legislation the State Department has used to develop a list of focused countries that are actively engaged in trafficking of threatened and endangered species. State and USAID are directed by the legislation to provide assistance to those focused countries to improve wildlife law enforcement and training. Um, I look forward to working with Senator Kuhn, Senator Graham, and others in this caucus so that we can continue our efforts to combat wildlife trafficking, and also use uh, some of the same techniques we've used there to try to identify and prevent pathways that lead to transmission of zoonotic diseases from illegal wildlife trade and, and wet markets. Uh, so I think we have a foundation upon which to work. I think we're going to hear from Senator Udall in a moment here. Uh, certainly, he's been engaged in that, too. In fact, uh, he's also been engaged in providing funding for these as the uh, co-author with me of the multi-species conservation funds that come out of the uh, uh, the species stamp bill that, uh, that that we passed that's that's used for trying to help stop the illegal trade of endangered species. Uh, in any case, we we know for sure these zoonotic diseases uh, can occur not just from exotic or endangered wildlife, but from common species like bats. So it's 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 broader uh, than just our endangered species. We also know that it's in situations where humans are interacting closely with wildlife and where wildlife is interacting closely with other wildlife, uh, that the risk of these transmissions increases. It's certainly worse in some instances than others. Um, some of these wildlife markets and um, these wet markets are uh, entirely unsanitary. They're, they're densely populated. Uh, they carry animals that are at higher risk of transmitting the disease. So not, not all markets are equal, which I think we'll hear about later today, too. So as we move forward, I think we need to focus uh, on the zoonotic uh, transmission. We also don't need to strike that right balance between reducing these risk factors while still, while still recognizing the importance of food sources and food safety, uh, including food sources and food safety that involve wildlife, especially for rural populations in Asia and Africa today. And I think we can find that balance. So again, I want to thank ICCF for putting this together. Uh, this is, uh, as far as I know, one of the first uh, remote caucus briefings that we have had, um, and I hope we'll have many more in the future. I think uh, remote hearings and voting um, and the ability for members to convene when we cannot be in Washington are really important. And so the topic is critical here, but so is the, the format. If this works, uh, perhaps we'll see more of these in the future, maybe even with some of our congressional committees. I certainly hope so. So thanks again, Susan. Uh, thank you, David. And I look forward to hearing from our panelists today. Thank you. 
Chairman McCollum, thank you, Senators. Uh, I would now like to introduce our expert panelists. Um, I think we have a lot to Yes, hear. yes, Senate. Here, Senator Udall is here. Senator, please. Yeah, let, let me, uh, thank you very much, Susan. Can, can everybody hear me? Yes, yeah, we can. Thank you. Susan, is it okay? We're hoping, yeah. yes, we were hoping that we would hear from you. It's a little difficult with the technology to actually know what's going on, so forgive us, Senator, please. Okay, well, let, let me uh, first thank my fellow co-chairs. It's always great to share in whatever technological venue with Representative McCollum, with, with uh, Rob Portman, who I always work closely with, and I know Senator Whitehouse, I heard his voice earlier there, and also uh, Dave, the great uh, appropriator, though, over there in the House. So, um, you know, holding a briefing like this completely online is a new arrangement, but the public health imperative of this pandemic demands immediate attention and action. Thank you to the witnesses here today. You all have tremendous expertise, and I'm sure we will learn a lot from you. COVID-19 is not the world's first pandemic caused by zoonotic transmission, and it will not be the last. Next time, the United States and the world must be more prepared. And now that we appreciate the scope, magnitude, and severity of the cost of a pandemic, we must act to prevent animal-to-human transmission of viruses. That not only threaten millions of lives, but can take down the global economy. The fact is, Diseases originating from animals that infect people comprise the majority of recurrent and emerging infectious disease threats we face today. This is one of the greatest public health challenges before us. If nothing else, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought into stark relief that we must devote the necessary resources to preventing and enforcing against illegal wildlife trafficking and markets. I've fought long and hard for adequate budgets for Fish and Wildlife Service enforcement as ranking member on the Senate Interior Appropriations Committee, and I'll continue to do so. And now's not the time to think about slashing USAID funds. Our NGO partners are doing good work around the world with those grant funds. It's time to increase enforcement and anti-trafficking funding to a level where we can really make a difference. I'd like to make two important points that are not receiving the attention they should before jumping off here and listening to our experts. First, speaking as the Vice Chairman of the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs, any action Congress takes must protect the ability of indigenous people around the world to feed themselves and their families and keep their cultural traditions alive. Traditional foods obtained through Sustainable hunting and gathering are critical to supporting the health and cultural traditions of indigenous peoples. And we must protect native people's ways of life that stretch back millennia as we protect global health from illegal wildlife trafficking and markets. Second, we must broaden the conversation beyond illegal wildlife trafficking to talk about stopping the wholesale destruction of nature. The science is clear that a major factor in the spread of zoonotic disease is the loss and fragmentation of wildlife habitat and populations, and bringing humans and urban populations into closer and more frequent contact with wild animals. The smaller and more compact the ecosystem, the easier zoonotic diseases spread. So yet again, the more we take care of nature, the more we take care of ourselves. I've sponsored Senate Resolution 372, the 30 by 30 resolution to save nature in the Senate. My New Mexico colleague, Representative Deb Holland, has introduced the House version. The plan is straightforward. As an interim goal, we must save 30% of U.S. lands and waters by 2030. Our, 20, our 30 by 30 resolution aligns with the international effort to protect 30% of the globe's natural world by 2020. And then we must work 
toward saving 50%. We need to save part to save the whole. But a strong and resilient natural world leads to a stronger and more resilient human population. Protecting nature protects humanity by giving wildlife space and helping prevent these diseases from migrating to people. Thank you again for convening. I hope today's briefing produces action items for Congress going forward. Look forward to hearing the experts. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Udall, Senator Portman, and Chairman McCullum for those very pertinent issues and perspectives. We'll now hear from our expert panelists who will address different aspects of this crisis and potential solutions. And I would like to start with John Scanlon, a special envoy for African Parks, uh, former Secretary General of CITES. John, you have the floor. Thank you, Susan. And uh, sincere thanks to the co-chairs for convening this uh, Conservation Caucus and to our good friends and colleagues at the ICCF for facilitating this virtual hearing. Uh, as you're aware, a wet market in Wuhan, China, uh, may be the origin of the outbreak of the coronavirus which has led to calls to ban all wet markets and stop all wildlife trade. Wet markets not only exist in Asia, but in Africa and Latin America, and depending on how they are defined, are found worldwide. Trade in wildlife, both legal and illegal, affects every country in one way or another. These are challenging global interconnected issues and a collective effort is needed to address them. And my written testimony sets out a series of immediate short-term and longer-term actions that could be taken to avert the next wildlife-related pandemic, but in the time available, I'll just highlight a few of them. We firstly need some definitions about, around what we mean by a wet market and wildlife trade so that we can focus our efforts on the areas of risk and avoid any unintended consequences. For the reasons outlined in my written testimony, I talk of high-risk markets, wildlife trade and consumption. Wet markets, wildlife trade and consumption that do pose a high risk to human health should be banned immediately as a precautionary measure. But these decisions can only be taken at the national level, but to be effective, any bans or closures of wet markets and any further restrictions on wildlife trade and consumption will need to be applied and enforced across all countries to stave off future pandemics. As such, we need to embed this decision-making into an open and transparent international legal framework. There is, however, at present no international legal agreement that enables wildlife markets, trade or consumption to be banned on public health grounds. The international regime for regulating wildlife trade, combating illegal trade and wildlife crime more generally is inadequate for regulating the high-risk wildlife trade markets and consumption that could lead to the next pandemic as well as for ending wildlife crime. International trade in wildlife is regulated through a convention known as CITES, but trade is regulated to avoid overexploitation, and wild animals and plants are brought under its trade-related controls based upon agreed biological and trade criteria. It does not take public health issues into account in its decision-making. A way of example, pangolins are listed as we heard, but the horseshoe bats are not. We've known for some time now that serious wildlife crime is organized and transnational, is fueled by corruption and has a devastating impact on wildlife, local communities, national economies, security, public health and entire ecosystems. But this is now increasingly obvious. With new and possibly, with new national and possibly international laws being enacted to ban high risk wet markets and trade in and consumption of certain wildlife on public health grounds, the need for an effective global enforcement response is greater than ever. If not, such markets and trade may simply move underground, which will further exacerbate the problem rather than diminish the health risk. Yet remarkably, there is no global legal agreement on wildlife crime. Profound changes are needed to the current legal framework if we are to have any hope of preventing the next wildlife-related pandemic. Firstly, we need to amend CITES to directly incorporate public health issues into its mandate or develop a new agreement. And secondly, we must treat wildlife crime as a serious crime and embed it in the global criminal law framework by bringing it under the UN Convention Against Transnational Organised Crime. And to be as effective as possible, a scaled-up enforcement effort will need to be complemented by well-targeted demand reduction campaigns, 
and where necessary, initiatives to provide alternative sources of protein and livelihoods to people severely affected by any bans, noting that traditional uses should not be impacted. It is, however, it is best, however, to take measures to stop the illegal taking, trade and consumption of wildlife before it ever happens, by better protecting wildlife at its source and its habitat. When they have a stake in it, local communities are the best protectors of wildlife at its source before it ever enters illegal trade, thereby helping avert the next wildlife-related pandemic. Wildlife-based tourism revenue is a critical part of the financing of nature conservation, especially in developing countries. The current loss of revenue and related jobs is seriously challenging wildlife protection efforts and could lead to an increase in poaching, degradation of ecosystems and instability, thereby increasing the threat posed by high-risk wildlife trade. We must find a way to bridge this financing gap. And looking ahead, in order to better protect wildlife at source, we need to focus our collective efforts around large-scale, long-term commitments to wildlife-rich places that are included in protected areas and other effective area-based conservation measures, and that can deliver multiple benefits. When well managed, these areas provide security for people and wildlife and bring about stability and law and order, creating the conditions needed to attract tourism, secure carbon, combat poaching, protect biodiversity, and create decent local jobs in remote areas. Yet while there are multiple benefits of nature conservation, these are not sufficiently recognized by health, development, or security initiatives or financing. As the benefits of effective nature conservation extends well beyond wildlife, so too must the sources of financing. Co-chairs, if we manage to take these actions, I believe we will be well-placed to avert the next wildlife-related pandemic. But if we do not act boldly now to institutionalize the changes that are needed to laws, funding, and programs, I fear we may find ourselves back in the same place in the not too distant future. My written testimony is available and I'll provide it online as well. And I thank you very much for the invitation to address you today. Many thanks, John, for that testimony. We look forward to asking you questions when all the panelists have spoken. So I'd now like to ask Dr. Christian Walzer from Wildlife Conservation Society to present next. Okay. Good afternoon, US Senators, members of Congress. International Conservation Caucus co-chairs and members of the International Conservation Caucus. Thanks very much for the opportunity to testify. I'm Dr. Christian Walzer. I'm a board certified wildlife veterinarian, the executive director of health at the Wildlife Conservation Society, and a tenured professor in conservation medicine. I've spent the last 30 years of my career working globally at the interfaces between wildlife and humans and livestock. For 125 years, the Wildlife Conservation Society has pursued a singular mission, that of saving wildlife and wild places on a global scale. Today, WCS, headquartered at the Bronx Zoo, has boots on the ground conservation programs in more than 60 countries and across the world's oceans. WCS has scientists, veterinarians, conservationists, and many other experts whose years of experience in wildlife health, wildlife trade and trafficking, and conservation inform our views and policies. My testimony here um, adds to the written testimony which is available. And it focuses on three core recommendations for immediate US government leadership and action to prevent future pandemics. And that is to end the commercial trade and use of wildlife for human consumption through diplomatic programmatic measures, provide federal agency support to enforce closures globally, and to bolster USAID food security and nutrition programs that provide for alternative protein sources for food insecure communities affected by such closures. Support and ensure adequate funding for USAID Emerging Threats Division and the proposed strategies to prevent spillover initiative and the Global Health Security Program. And to pr protect intact ecosystem health by funding programs including USAID bio Biodiversity, Combating Wildlife Trafficking Programs, the Global Environment Facility, US Fish and Wildlife Services International Programs. The COVID-19 coronavirus has really catapulted across the ever-evolving interface between wildlife and humans. What was immediately apparent was that the virus was responsible, that the virus responsible for the outbreak had most likely originated in wild animals. It had spilled from its natural environment and ancestral bat host across a wildlife trading market, just as the virus responsible for SARS likely did in 2002. 
it is really essential to understand that more than 75% of all new infectious diseases in humans have their origin in animals. More than 335 emerging infectious disease outbreaks were reported worldwide between 1940 and 2004, which is more than 50 per decade. This rate of outbreaks is increasing. Among emerging infectious diseases specifically, about 70% of the outbreaks have originated in wildlife. However, conclusively determining index cases is always difficult, but have been associated with wildlife trading and processing markets for human consumption. As I said, it is thought that the SARS coronavirus evolved and passed through civets from a bat host crossing the wildlife-human interface. But what is unknown at, the point, at this point in time is where and how the SARS coronavirus too passed to humans. Populations of wild animals naturally carry a high diversity of potential zoonotic pathogens, especially where the diversity of host animals is higher, as it is in the world's tropics. Most diseases in wild animals remain very poorly studied, many pathogens remain unidentified, and many outbreaks are overlooked. It is estimated that there are some 1.6 million potential viruses in mammals and birds, of which some 700,000 could pose a future risk to human health. The commercial wildlife trade, be it legal or illegal, is always a high-risk entity. It is always risky. It involves the capture and transport and containment of wild animals, causing them stress, injury, sickness, and compromised immune systems. These wildlife markets constitute true cauldrons of contagion, and one could not design better conditions for the emergence of new diseases. Our recommendations do not pertain to the subsistence hunting by indigenous peoples and local communities for household consumption. It's no small task to predict which of the millions of unknown pathogens are going to become bad actors in the future. But our future health and economic security requires an immediate and permanent ban of the commercial collection, trade, and marketing of wildlife for human con consumption. If this trade and large commercial markets for wildlife for human consumption continue unabated, then the risk for another pandemic will remain very high. I think the US government has an opportunity to lead at this time by helping to stop the commercial trade of wildlife, to increase and support zoonotic disease surveillance and foreign aid for um, nature protection and environmental um, protection, fund federal biodiversity programs that protect ecosystem intactness and halt habitat destruction, and it's important to remember, finally, that a pandemic is not a one-country problem, and solutions will arise when ban countries band together to change the root causes. If strong and decisive action is not taken, COVID-19 will not be the last of our pandemics. Thank you. Thank you, Christian, very much for that perspective. Absolutely, I think we're all going to be in agreement, if, if we're not already, that this is a global response that's necessary. Um, I'd like to ask Dr. Mendima from IFA now to talk about the law enforcement component that is uh, key to the solutions that we need to achieve. Jamil? National Conservation Caucus and members of Congress and ICCL for inviting me to testify on this very important issue of linking commercial trade, consumption of wildlife, COVID-19, and how we should resolve to avoid future pandemics. I'll focus my testimony on importance of role of law enforcement in protecting against future pandemics. The men and women that are in the front lines are day in, day out, protecting the very resources that are a global heritage. And it is important for us to ensure that we continue to provide that support even in this day and age when we are dealing with the pandemic. I want to just highlight some of the incoming information from the field, the global south, where most of these resources are. We are already seeing as a result of COVID-19 reduced revenue sources as a result of tourism closures. The Victoria Falls shared by Zambia and Zimbabwe is closed, and that's a World Heritage Site that is a cash cow to support conservation needs. Zambia government has already pointed to an estimated $90 million reduction in their revenue flows that support law enforcement. Kenya in East Africa has also focused on a reduction of 98.5% of revenue. Zimbabwe, 90%, and many other countries are doing the same. Ladies and gentlemen, this in itself is going to have a negative impact on how we can secure the resources and be able to do counter-poaching 
counter trafficking. And it is key that as we talk of COVID-19, we address the root causes. How did we end up in getting viruses jump from wildlife to people? And I did capture a lot of details on that in my written submission. In this day and age where we are seeing uh, social distancing happening in all countries, it means that the informal sector is no longer able to actually subsist on the trading they do all the time. And they are likely to turn to other ways of surviving to put food on the table, which could also escalate poaching as well as trafficking. Some of the issues we are already hearing is around poisoning of elephants in wildlife reserves using cyanide. And we know when that happens, it also kills and destroys the entire food chain. We need, therefore, to continue to ramp up our efforts to support law enforcement, the men and women on the ground working with communities. The root causes are all around ecosystem health, and we have ourselves as humanity destroyed this resource, and we need to really do something and agree on a package deal to make sure that we have a plan that can stop this as a global intervention. I want to highlight a few on the ground work that IFO is doing in Malawi, Zambia, Transfrontier area, where with support from USAID, we have been able to promote interagency collaboration for counter poaching, to also deal with human wildlife conflict using technology and to train rapid response units that are able to respond quickly and foster trust between two countries that are managing a very critical habitat, which is the essence of sustainable landscapes and biodiversity conservation. We are also ensuring in our work in Malawi and Zambia that communities are actively involved. And even in this time of COVID-19, our rangers are helping to support and supply some of the clinics with materials to stay clean and be, to promote sanitation. We are looking at how this has actually brought a lot of changes since 2015 when we have seen more convictions and prosecutions of criminals because of the ability for us to ramp up law enforcement. Now, a lot of what we are doing across this size is because of the leadership that the US government continues to provide. And I want to give a shout out and really ask you as leaders to continue to promote more investments by US government. Through USID, the State Department of Wildlife Trafficking Programs, in the Office of Law Enforcement, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, they are collectively able to build capacity across the world and allowing us to be able to really deal with law enforcement effectively. Some of the law hanging results as a result of this support are how we have been able to set up forensic laboratories to ensure that the evidence gathered can end up getting the syndicates of criminals busted and allow to us to protect the very resources that are now being traded, ending up in wet markets and causing this jump to create pandemics. As I conclude, I do want to highlight that it is key for us to continue to ramp up law enforcement at all levels, making sure that we are present, preventing future pandemics of zoonotic origins. Enforcement in itself, though, cannot exist in a vacuum, and we must take the necessary steps to deal with the root cause of wildlife crime, including poverty alleviation, food insecurity, and reducing the demand for illegal products in the market areas. Let us all team up together to invest in sustainable landscapes and biodiversity conservation. And in this way, our responsible way of dealing with holistic, transformational, and comprehensive interventions will allow us to prevent future pandemics. I really want us to all take bold action, explore options for debt swaps for nature, and anything that should be in the, in the toolbox so that we are able to do business differently from what we've been doing because this is a global issue. It is important for us to ramp up law enforcement and again to have US government leadership as we deal with this issue of pandemics. Thank you again for the chance to testify and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Jamil, and, and for pointing out that this will take a multi-stakeholder approach. There's no question. And now for our last expert panelist, I'd like to invite David Quammen, author of the prophetic book, Spillover, Animal Infections, and the Next Human Pandemic. David? Thank you very much, Susan. And thank you, senators and congresspersons, for giving me the chance to talk with you this afternoon. Thank you, Dave, for inviting me to be part of this 
Uh, thank you in particular, Senator Portman, for that very friendly uh, call out. I envy you springtime in Cincinnati right now. We've got fresh snow on the ground here in, um, uh, in Bozeman, Montana. Uh, I'm going to skip through the first few couple of paragraphs of uh, my remarks as I sketch them down because they were going to be the ABCs of zoonotic diseases, but everybody here already knows the ABCs of zoonotic diseases. We've got these strange viruses. They come out of wildlife. There's been a drumbeat of new viruses emerging over the past 60 years. Machupo in Bolivia, 1961, Marburg coming out of Uganda to Marburg, Germany, 1967. Ebola, 1976. Uh, Sin nombre virus in the Four Corners area, 1992. Bird flu, Hong Kong, 1997. Uh, Hendra virus, 1994 in Australia. Nipah virus, Malaysia and Bangladesh, 1998. SARS out of Southern China, 2003. MERS, the Arabian Peninsula, 2012. And I haven't even mentioned HIV. We now know from good, solid molecular evidence that the AIDS pandemic began with spillover of a chimpanzee virus from a single chimpanzee into a single human in the southeastern corner of Cameroon back around 1908, give or take a margin of error, 1908. Very different from the story that most people think they know about the origins of the AIDS pandemic. But that's an so that is an, an excellent example of how bushmeat, quote unquote bushmeat, can, can trigger an international pandemic. Some of these new viruses uh, also have high rates of mutation, meaning they can evolve quickly and adapt to new circumstances. And uh, that capacity for fast evolution might allow them to uh, improve their transmissibility among humans, increase their virulence, or possibly decrease their virulence as they replicate and spread. And it might also allow a virus to work around a vaccine. So which viruses have that sort of intrinsic evolvability, that capacity to evolve quickly? Among the groups at the top of the list are the influenza viruses and the coronaviruses. And scientists have been saying that for decades, and I and others have been trying to amplify what they were saying. Um, the animal in which uh, these deadly viruses live inconspicuously over time uh, without causing symptoms is known as the reservoir host. And uh, that might be a rodent, might be a monkey, might be a bird. In a lot of the cases we've been hearing, hearing about, of course, it's a bat, one or more species of bat. Hendra virus in Australia, bats. Nipah virus in Bangladesh, bats. Marburg virus in East Africa, bats before it went into the monkeys that went to Germany. The SARS virus, bats. And now again with this new coronavirus. I could talk about why bats, but I'll, I'll, I'll skip over that for the sake of brevity. Uh, it's, um, there are complicated but very solid answers to why bats seem to be overly represented as reservoir hosts. Oh, there are also the amplifier hosts. If a virus spills over in from its reservoir host into another form of animal and replicates there and from that animal passes into humans, might be a pig, might be a horse, might be a pangolin, might be a palm civet, um, then we call that an amplifier host. The consequence of all this, we all know, is obvious. The capture and killing of wild animals for food uh, or for any other reason brings humans into potentially close contact with this great diversity of viruses that live in our wildlife. Um, and that's especially true when, when the capturing or the killing is done in highly diverse ecosystems where there are more kinds of viruses. Um, these viruses don't want to infect humans. Viruses have no wishes, no desires. They have no malicious intent. They simply follow the basic Darwinian imperative. When opportunity presents, Reproductive instinct will cause this living creature and that living creature to seize opportunity. By increasing your numbers, if you're that creature, by extending your existence as much as possible through space and time. And evolution by natural selection will help you find ways to succeed. There are 7.7 .7 billion of us humans on this planet right now. For a virus, we are habitat. We are opportunity. 
And in fact, for virus, infecting humans is the ultimate opportunity. I'll, uh, I'll end by saying that, in, in my view, uh, in purely Darwinian terms, the most successful viruses on Earth right now are HIV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. Uh, again, thank you, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, David. I, I know we have uh, a number of members on the call still and eager to ask questions of the panelists. I'm going to go, and, and again, please forgive us, it's, it's not, um, it's a little challenging to know for sure who, who is still on, but we will do our best. And I would like to request, um, first of all, I'm going to list the co-chairs of the International Conservation Caucus and give them the opportunity uh, to ask questions. Um, I'm being given notes that I believe that Senators Portman Udall and White House um, and Congressman Fortenberry and Congressman Joyce are on. So in that order, um, I will ask Senator Portman if you would like to ask a question. Senator. Great, this, this is Rob Portman. I'll just ask a quick question and then I'd love to hear from my colleagues. Uh, um, and this is, I think, best addressed uh, to you, Mr. Scanlon, it has to do with recent reports we've seen in the Wall Street Journal and elsewhere that China is now offering a, a rebate, um, a 9% rebate, we're told, on the export of animal products. Uh, and we're understanding that includes snakes, turtles, primate meat, uh, beaver, civet, cat, musk, and other things. Uh, does this concern you? Could this increase the spread of zoonotic diseases? Thank you very much, uh, Senator, for the question. Um, I'm not familiar with the exact nature of this rebate. I think what we're wanting to see now is a, is a greater emphasis on the health implications of any wildlife market or wet market, trade or consumption. Uh, to date, a lot of the focus or primary focus has been on sustainability of trade, on, on uh, factors of, of the uh, survival of the species in the wild. And what we need to move to is to incorporate within our thinking, referencing to the health impacts of any market that's selling uh, wildlife, any trade or any consumption, which is a shift in thinking from where we've been with traditional thinking about wildlife, trade, markets and consumption. So I think we need a fundamental shift in thinking, not just in terms of national actions, but we need to build this into the international architecture. And I would suggest we build it into the CITES convention by building a new stream of uh, interest in human health and allow decisions to be taken on the basis of human health, be it listing a species, for example, horseshoe bat is not listed, but you'd think it would be listed if it's a human health issue, um, and to look at human health issues in terms of any decisions that relate to, to trade and consumption. So I think we need a fundamental shift in thinking away from sustainability to adding to that uh, fundamental consideration of human health aspects of any decisions relating to markets, trade or consumption. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Don. Senator Whitehouse, do you have a question? And now panelists are all unmuted, so we should not experience that delay. Thank you again for bearing with us. Great, thank you for unmuting me. And um, thank you for the hearing. I think we have, um, a real opportunity to reach beyond the traditional audience of uh, conservation groups. Now that there's a clear understanding of how this element of uh, our failure to uh, address nat uh, natural conservation has created this terrible disease risk for mankind that we are now uh, living through with COVID. And um, I'm wondering what you think, what the panel thinks, and they can take this as a question for the record if they'd like, um, and just get back to us uh, in writing. Um, what are the key touch points in international organizations and in international law, and perhaps in US trade policy, that would allow us to have the most direct effect at trying to protect um, these uh, animals protect their habitat while keeping them out of wet markets and other places where the disease transmission takes place. Christian, would you like to answer that? 
Yeah, so I think it's really important. Thank you very much for that question. And I think it's really important to clearly understand the disease risk is not dependent on if it's sustainably harvested, if it's legal or legal. It's the simple fact of using wildlife as a food source on a commercial scale. You're just, it's a numbers game. You're bringing huge amounts of wildlife together at a certain point with many, many people and creating opportunities where viruses can skip through the various barriers to enter humans. And, you know, we have to be careful. Some of the countries which are, um, uh, you know, seen as a source and where most of these large markets are, China and Vietnam, have already reacted very, very rap rapidly. And, you know, February 3rd, China already banned the trade of um, wildlife. Um, the president himself, Xi Jinping, actually issued a statement, and now movement is going on to um, turn that into a permanent ban. And also, Vietnam has stepped up and said, we will permanently ban the use of wildlife. So we need to be careful that in the actions that we support and everything, we're not behind that curve. We need to be ahead and support countries to enable them to ban wildlife trade on this scale. And I really want to make it clear, it's not about sustainable use. It's commercial, large-scale um, wildlife trade, which is happening in urban centers by the new middle class that has the money to buy this very expensive and luxury products. It's very important to see that. But we need to be ahead of the curve and support other countries to now move forwards to also ban this um, use of wildlife. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Senator. I'd like to call on Congressman Fortenberry next. Um, Congressman, do you have a question for our panelists? Thank you, Susan. I appreciate it. I'm going to turn on my video here since I'm proud of my background, as we talked about earlier. I'm actually in my office in Lincoln, Nebraska, and this is a canvas painting um, that I think is very appropriate for the occasion. Anyway, thank you very much for holding this hearing and all of our experts, uh, panelists, for uh, the deep dive here on the dynamics of this, uh, the origins of this disease and, and using this real moment of international national trauma. There's so much suffering, so much difficulty that began to unpack creatively through this technology, the longer term answers that we have to find. Uh, both Senator Portman and Senator Whitehouse touched on some key considerations here. One might be the silver lining in that this pandemic is going to rapidly elevate and, uh, and hopefully deepen and sensitize us all that we live in an ecosystem where uh, what we do economically, uh, what we do in terms of development uh, affects things. Um, these aren't isolated types of movements any longer between inside of nations, but the reality of how we affect one another in terms of our production, in terms of our trade, in terms of our uh, national integrity, and the systems that we set up. Um, hopefully this pandemic again allows an elevation of consciousness to understand that um, what we do affects one another, our food, our, our health and well-being our own deep sense of security where we live, even though this originated far, far away. So, um, and I do think it, it, it correlates or aligns with the deepening human awareness that the ideals, the imaginative possibilities of, of conservation, of protecting pristine ecosystems, of creating enhanced biodiversity, of appropriately using the resources we have, but, but moving away from just an extractive type of economic base where we take and we make and we waste to one that's regenerative uh, is also going to maybe be unpacked after this the, the great suffering that has been caused here so I'm sorry to editorialize a little bit I keep in the midst of trying to deal with constituents who are, have lost jobs businesses who are on the edge a healthcare system that we don't want to see overrun by this pandemic I, I'm in a certain way having to resist the temptation to project out and unpack what are the policy measures moving forward after this. And it does, I think, go, it, it, it creates a possibility of some real realignment, both in trade and national security, how we think about authentic relations with other countries, and again, this interconnectedness in one large ecosystem. Uh, with that said, uh, are we, let, let, I was 
did texting with someone who was watching the hearing and, and wanted to raise the possibility that we're, we very readily assign this, the source of this pandemic, pandemic to the wet market uh, animal to human transfer. Uh, there is some consideration that this might have been leakage. Uh, the biology of this might have been leakage out of a laboratory in China. So this is a little bit of an aside for this hearing, but I do think it's an important dynamic to understand that the manipulation of viruses and the potential weaponization of this is another problem that we have. That We'll spend a lot on bullets and armaments and such, but the, the reality of this kind of thing, again, being unleashed in the world, whether or not this is intentional, whether or not it was accidental, or whether or not, yes, it's fully explainable through the, the wet market dynamic, again, is another problem for humanity and is going to raise consciousness about this. Do any of you have any comments on those theories that are out there? Congressman, yes, I'd like to jump in there. And, and uh, it's a very good point that you raise. Um, and I, I think it really sort of divides into, into two points very quickly. First, I've also seen um, the coverage in the Wall Street Journal this morning um, about some, uh, I believe it was some, some memos in the State Department that, that passed uh, maybe a year ago after um, uh, representatives of the U.S. State Department were sent to the Wuhan Institute of Virology to take a look at it and to take a look at the, the level of biosecurity there for the research that's being done on, on dangerous coronaviruses, particularly in the lab of Dr. Uh, Zhengli Shi. Um, those uh, biosecurity measures are very, very important, and the scientists I talk to agree that it's very important, first of all, to do work, to do research on dangerous viruses discovered from the wild, and secondly, to make sure that it's very secure so that there is no leakage. In this case, although there was concern raised in the State Department that there, there might be a risk of leakage, there is no evidence that, that this virus has leaked from a laboratory at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Uh, I would be very interested to see that evidence if it, if it existed, but it's not there, um, and I don't expect it to be there. I expect that this has come from a wild horseshoe bat. However, there is also, um, uh, there's a scientific paper that I have in front of me that was published in The Lancet, very respected British uh, medical journal, and it talks about the first 41 confirmed patients in Wuhan, and it says most of them had direct contact with the Huanan wholesale seafood market, most of them. So this was published in February, and since then, people have commonly been saying this virus comes from the Huanan wholesale seafood market. There was some sort of a spillover, either from a bat or from an amplifier host, such as a pangolin. Um, but um, People who have read this paper closely, including uh, an American physician and scholar named Daniel Lucy, has pointed out, he has pointed out, that it says most of the first cases have come from the market. 27 out of 41 of the first cases were traced directly to the market. What about the other 14? He says, what about the other 14? And if you look at the data carefully in this paper, you see that the very first confirmed case, confirmed on December 1st in the city of Wuhan, had no known direct or indirect contacts with the Huanan wholesale seafood market, the very first case. And as Daniel Lucy says, what that suggests is that this virus was circulating in the community of Wuhan during the month of November for that person to become infected and show symptoms by December 1st. And, and what uh, Lucy, Dr. Lucy suggests is the idea that this virus did spill over from a bat, but maybe the bat hadn't gotten to the market yet, it spilled over into a human, it circulated a little bit, or maybe more than a little bit in Wuhan, and then eventually humans carried the virus into the Wanan wholesale seafood market, as well as carrying the virus out of that market. This is a paper by Huang, H-U-A-N-G, and, uh, and colleagues, clinical features of patients infected with 2019 novel coronavirus. Uh, I can send the link to Susan if anyone is interested in it. She can pass the link along. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thoughtful. Very thoughtful. Thank you. Could I add to that, please? There's some just one other really important point, which was not answered by David. Thanks very much, David. That was a very comprehensive and great answer, and I agree absolutely with you. But also, I just want to make one thing really clear. 
there's absolutely no evidence to suggest that the virus was created in the lab. You know, and that has been published on the 17th of March by our colleagues Anderson and others in Nature, which is really, it's a very comprehensive review. I'm happy to share that with you anytime. And the other thing I also want to align, which has not sort of got lost a little bit, there were, unfortunately, the animals were removed from the market very, very quickly. And I think most people would have done that and they were not sampled. So we don't know, and we're gonna have a lot of difficulty working out where the virus came from and where it transitioned from, that's for sure. But one thing is clear, they took 30, they took some 500 um, environmental samples in that market. And 33 of those were positive. And of those 33, 31 came from the western part of the market, which is that part where their wildlife was housed. So on a precautionary principle, I'm certainly not going to start following all kinds of other theories when I do have a strong signal coming out of that wildlife market corner of of the, of the big market. So I think we need to be careful and we need to really be, it's, it, this is really an infodemic. So much information is getting out there which has no basis in fact. We need to be careful and evaluate carefully on a precautionary principle how we move forward. Thank you. Congressman Cuellar, would you like to question the panelists? Susan, thank you so much. And I wanna thank all my colleagues, House members and Senate members uh, so much for doing this. And to the uh, panelists, thank you so much. Uh, David, again, thank you. Uh, my question goes to, uh, to David um, uh, Kwamen. David, I, I've been reading the book, uh, your book, uh, that was written, I think, in 2012, uh, Spillover. Uh, I want to thank David Barron for uh, sending this book over. Uh, and what I want to ask you about this particular book is, is you wrote this book back in 2012. What were the warning signs that we missed that could have prevented uh, COVID-19 from emerging and spreading? Number one, what were the warning signs that we missed? And second of all, you wrote uh, different, uh, about different other uh, issues that we've had. How is this coronavirus different from the ones that you wrote about uh, back in 2012? Thank you, Congressman. Um, I'll answer that. I've, I've lost my video link, so I don't know if you can see me. I can't see anyone, and I'm not sure what button I touched. Um, this new coronavirus, you're right, that I wrote uh, in 2012, um, the book was published, and I wrote about the case of SARS, um, which was a coronavirus, uh, eventually shown to have its reservoir host in a bat, uh, came out of um, the bat somewhere in southern China in the uh, Pearl River Delta area, got to Hong Kong, spread through a, through a hotel, the Metropole Hotel, and, um, and then was carried in people who flew off home from vacations to Toronto, to Singapore, to um, Beijing eventually, um, Bangkok, uh, and uh, Hanoi. And uh, very quickly, this virus spread to those cities and uh, spread from human to human readily. There were super spreaders, very important phenomenon, the super spreading phenomenon, meaning one person, usually in a healthcare situation, possibly having a, a respiratory crisis, infects an extraordinary number of people might infect 20 people, this one case. So there were super spreaders in Toronto, for instance, and in Singapore. Um, SARS eventually was stopped by very good science and public health response, um, contact tracing, quarantining, uh, and so that it infected eventually 8,000 people and killed 774, 10% case fatality rate. How is it different from this this virus, this disease, uh, it wasn't as transmissible as this disease. It did not have the silent transmission, the cryptic transmission that this virus has, which is what makes it so very dangerous, uh, but it had a higher case fatality rate. If this virus had a case fatality rate of 10%, um, we would be facing um, misery and death far beyond what we're already facing. Um, so it's, it's an important difference that's probably just in, it's partly um, a matter of response and public health and control, but it's partly just the inherent capacity of, of that particular virus to kill 10% of the people that it infected. This virus doesn't need to kill people to be very successful. It's, uh, it's spreading around the world um, uh, quite, uh, quite competently as it is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Congressman Cuellar. Congressman Joyce, do you have a question for our panelists? 
Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, good. <clears throat> uh, it would appear, now I'm not a scientist, but it would appear that these unregulated, unhygienic wet markets or live animal markets are the perfect incubators for these viral infections. And yet, some wet markets bring together animals that carry diseases from different ecosystems into one location, which probably helps facilitate the spread of this in a way that might not happen otherwise. What if any safeguards are taking place in countries like China to address those concerns? So I could um, I can address that. You're quite right. Um, the main the main point is that these markets bringing together um, a, a huge amount of different species from all over the globe or all over the region, and they are able to exchange these viruses. So in the past, there was always a thought that you could sanitize these markets and that it was related to sustainable or illegal uh, trade. The, you know, the, the short answer is there is no safe um, consumption and use of uh, wildlife on this scale, on a commercial scale. And um, the, the measures that are being taken, um, WCS um, is working with our partners in China and throughout Southeast Asia to work on new legislation and new regulations that stop this trade and that limit the use of um, wildlife generally. Um, so. It's a very, very active um, scene at the moment. Um, all the legislation is being um, revisited. Um, in, in China, um, it's uh, the wildlife protection law, the biosecurity law, and the animal epidemic prevention law. All of these are being um, revised. And um, so we, we really hope that in, in a few weeks, a uh, few months, um, this will be um, you know, a fixed in legislation, and that will change the, the risk potential uh, massively. And then, you know, we'll, we'll have to address the other markets and other interfaces, um, uh, as um, John has brought up and others. There are many other interfaces that we will need to address, but the most important is these live animal markets where animals can be shedding for days and days on end. Uh, and then we'll take the next step after that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We, we also have a number of members of the caucus um, who are with us now that we've heard from the co-chairs, and I'm going to call on those uh, one by one. If you have a question, please ask. If you don't, if you wouldn't mind just telling us, we can move on to the next member of Congress. So, um, Congressman Quigley, would you like to ask a question? Thanks, and I appreciate your participation today. Uh, I'd like uh, for someone or uh, a couple to talk about uh, where we are with uh, communication and cooperation between governments, health organizations, law enforcement, wildlife organizations. Uh, how is it now and how, how can it get better? Thank you for that the question, uh, Congressman. Um, what we are doing right now, there are a lot of ongoing you know, conversations amongst NGO members to build alliances and uh, try to scale up some of the existing collaborations between government, private sector, the health sector, development sector, and in particular, ensuring that you can you know, really nip the bud of the root causes around coordinated development initiatives and securing space for wildlife and in the process minimize the contact between human beings and wildlife because ultimately we realize the problem of really pandemics is a human problem not a wildlife problem pandemics know no borders wildlife knows no borders but we are the ones in our quest for development and food production and consumption habits that are perpetuating this. So we are really fostering those dialogues. And our belief from IFO is that we need to scale that up and double down and make sure this is a global initiative and are all talking about that and to marshal and get resources that can be put in long staying power. Thank you. Yeah, so maybe if I could add to that from a One Health perspective. So in 2004, um, you know, the Wildlife Conservation Society um, developed a One Health uh, perspective. And that's been recently upgraded with the help of the German government. And um, the, the point is when we want to address these kind of complex issues at the interface between the environment, um, humans and wildlife, we need, we need a very comprehensive and holistic approach to health. And that in the international organizations that we need to coordinate better with is definitely the WHO, OIE, FAO. That is really important to strengthen this tripartite um, collaboration, but also 
under the guidance of USAID projects, we were able to really develop a strong workforce and um, capacities in many of the countries which are the origin of these, um, of these viruses. So, you know, um, coordinating um, US agencies with international organizations in a One Health approach is definitely the way forward. Congressman Westerman, are you with us? Would you like to ask a question of our expert panel? I'm here and I would like to ask a question. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, please. Okay, thank you. Very informative uh, discussion. I appreciate uh, you all doing this. And uh, as I listened early on, I heard a lot about the importance of, of habitat and biodiversity, and I'm going to put a shameless plug in here for the, the Trillion Trees Act because that's a lot of what we're trying to accomplish with the Trillion Trees Act is to have healthy forests, which creates um, good environments and habitat for all kinds of wildlife and species. And we all know that trees are good for uh, removing carbon and storing it, trees and sustainable forestry. Uh, but they also provide clean water and wildlife habitat, and I don't think we tell that story often enough. Uh, so I think, I'm hoping we can incorporate some of these uh, great um, ideas into the, the True and Trees Act work that we're doing. But as we look at this policy, one concern that I have is if we um, put regulations in place, and if, if it happens around the world and the demand is still there for uh, the illegal trade of wildlife, uh, then we have something that's unregulated and it's <laughs> illegal and it seems like you could grow a larger uh, black market there and maybe even uh, make the problem worse. So how do we balance the, the policy and get the, uh, the results that we want to reduce the amount of this uh, wildlife consumption? I'll come in quickly on the habitat protection just to say, if you look at natural resources in most of the source countries, these are really the social safety nets for which the local inhabitants are dependent on governments. And there is an appetite among local communities and willingness on, among governments to really collaborate across borders. So a lot of the transboundary initiative, transfrontier conservation area initiatives have been voluntarily initiated on a recognition of the shared common good that they need to be able to foster joint management and coordinated development. What we need to be able to complement that now is to mobilize the resources required, build the necessary capacity, and be able to have a longer term multi-year staying power to establish lasting governance bodies capacity which is owned on the ground by communities, by governments. And in that way, we deal with the, re the real root causes to sustain and help for resilience moving forward. Thank you, Jamil. Anyone Can else? Can I have... chime in there, Susan? Yes, please, John. Yeah, I think it's very important that we, we focus on places, places of high biodiversity value. Uh, what we've seen through the work of African parks, we've seen in Mozambique with Gorongosa, we've seen with Northern Rangelands Trust in Kenya, we've seen through the work of WCS and others, is that when you can focus on a place and invest in a place over the longer term, you get multiple benefits. You, you provide security for people and wildlife. You can generate local employment. You can secure the carbon. Um, you can uh, generate employment in so many different ways, there's ranges, et cetera. But what we need to do is focus on places that are biodiverse rich over the long term, invest over the long term, recognize the multiple benefits in terms of development, in terms of climate, in terms of biodiversity, and in terms of human health with stopping these uh, wild animals being taken for one reason or another, as well as plants and trees you were talking about. So if we can do that over the longer term, we're going to get fantastic benefits because local people where they have a stake in it are going to be the best protectors of the wildlife. So, but we also need to look at other sources of, of financing. If there's a development benefit, a security benefit, a health benefit, we need to also build into their thinking that they ought be investing in wildlife conservation as well. The other thing I think we need to do is put much more pressure on importing states the US has the Lacey Act. You have an obligation on importers to show 
uh, legal origin of any wildlife, uh, be it a plant or an animal, before it comes in. We really need to globalise the Lacey Act and have all countries um, put in place the same obligations on importers, that if you are importing wildlife from any country, uh, you need to demonstrate that you were able, that you uh, legally sourced that wildlife, whether it's an animal or a plant or timber or a fish. Um, without that, we've only been relying upon CITES, which is 36,000 out of 8 million species. Large number of species are not covered. And it's a trade convention, not a wildlife crime, not a crime convention. So I think focus more on places over the longer term, multiple benefits, and let's globalise that Lacey Act approach through a wildlife uh, crime protocol under the UN Convention on Transnational Organised Crime to put pressure on importing states, to put pressure on those that are importing wildlife to show legal origin under threat of criminal sanction. Thank you all panellists, members of Congress. Before I turn it over to David Barron, I want to say that the written testimonies of all our panellists are um, have been given to the um, members' offices. They will be in the congressional record. Um, I think this conversation is really just beginning, but I think we've all learned quite a bit today and we've been given some, some actions to take forward. So, David, I'd like to turn it over to you to close. Good. Can you hear me? Yes. Thanks. Um, uh, thanks to our ICCF team. Uh, the folks worked real hard on this. Um, our panelists, uh, we we had a home run with all four of you. Thanks so much. Our co-chairs, you all are always there. Wonderful. The other members, a lot of members signed in and out during the course of the day. I think we had about 20 members of Congress today. Um, it's always exciting to see the Democrats and the Republicans, the conservatives and the liberals in the House and the Senate working together. It's pretty damn rare these days, but they, they, our leadership works so well together on these issues that we're all committed to. U.S. standing tall in the world, but also encouraging our allies in other countries to stand up and take the lead. So thank you all. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done. This is it's sort of the beginning. Um, we will help consolidate a lot of these recommendations and back them up with good factual uh, documentation and and be assisting the leadership in the House and the Senate and in deciding what we can do ideally immediately uh, in the in the context of this immediate uh, uh, pandemic, the crisis. Uh, ideally, with funding in the fourth round, we hope, but uh, far beyond that and in passing legislation in parliaments around the world, in enforcing laws, and providing alternative resources to the people who are dependent on, on their natural resources for their survival, and um, and all of the other benefits to the, the humans who live with wildlife, clean water and and uh, clean air, and uh, the opportunity to uh, have. Good government, good governance, and and natural security, uh, as well as as the national security that's so important. Thank you. We'll we will be in touch, and we'll be following up quickly to the wider audience. We hope you'll join us for our next briefing. Thank you. <laughs>